answering this. Everyone in the world will see it someday. Okay. You can see it now. Okay. So what what is Pascal's wager? What does it mean? If you believe in God and there is a God, you'll go to heaven and you'll lose nothing. If you believe in God and there is no God, you'll gain nothing and you'll lose nothing. If you don't believe in God and there is a God, you'll gain nothing and lose everything. If you don't believe in God and there is no God, you gain nothing and you lose nothing. Good. Good. Okay. So it's a good it's a good wager. If we're gonna wager on something if you're just you know um, a person who's who, who realizes the, the the importance of the gamble, the, uh, the reward or the loss, it's better to bet on the, the the side that God exists and live your life accordingly, because you know, even if God doesn't exist, you're not going to lose anything. Maybe you'll lose a little sinful vice, uh, but that's about all. But if you bet on God that he doesn't exist and you lead your life as if he doesn't, especially that's sometimes what happens or oftentimes what happens, then, um, then you're going to lose everything because uh, you'll lose salvation. So it's, it's better just from a reasonable point of view to wager that God exists. And to put your faith in God. Now we know that using our reason, we can come to a knowledge of God's existence. And let me just take a look at that sheet on the Trinity, okay, because the Trinity we don't know from reason. We know it because God has revealed it to us. Okay. And um, the Trinity. This is an apologetics course, so giving a defense for the faith. Well, someone may say, well, how can you believe in three persons in one God? That doesn't make sense. Well, uh, we cannot fully fathom it, but uh, God has revealed it to us, and we can attempt to explain what three persons in one God means and how this can be uh, through through the use of our reason through theology. Okay? And you know, Jesus has revealed that there, are, that there are three persons in the one God through his own testimony. He refers to God the Father, my Father in heaven. I and the Father are one. So that's a revelation that, that they're one in nation, uh, nature, one in substance. And uh, Jesus reveals the Holy Spirit, whom he promised to send with the Father on Pentecost, and who came. So three persons in one God, just to, to make it clear again, this is not something that's revealed explicitly in the scriptures. You can read the Bible cover to cover. There's nowhere that says there are three persons in one God. The words Holy Trinity don't appear there. Even Trinity, they don't appear in the Bible. That's something that the church has taught through tradition, especially when the divinity of Christ was being challenged by a man named Arius, who was a priest, who convinced a lot of people that that uh, that Jesus was not God. And he used biblical um, evidence, so to speak. When Jesus, when he says, "Who is it that touched me?" Well, if he were God, he would know who touched him. The woman, Jesus knew who touched him. He wanted the woman to come forward. When um, the apostles asked Jesus. When he's talking about the end of the world, when will these things happen? Okay. And what does Jesus say? He says, no one knows when these things will happen. Only the Father knows, not even the Son. Well, if, uh, if Jesus were really God, wouldn't he know? There's an argument there. But Jesus was, this was his way of telling you his apostles and us that I can't reveal this to you when the, the exact time of my second coming will be the end of the world. Because if we look at other places in the scriptures, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. We, we couldn't say that. He couldn't say that unless he were God. So there is good evidence in the Bible that Jesus is God. Before Abraham was, I am. That's what Jesus said. And the, the Pharisees and the scribes knew that he was making himself out to be God. This I am comes from the 
Hebrew word. Anyone know what it is? Yahweh. Yahweh. I am who am. Okay. Name's up. No, no. Okay. What are you doing there? Uh, uh, for this class, okay? Turn it off. Put it in the, your bed. Thank you. Jimmy. 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 So, um, we're, we're talking about the Trinity here, Jim. Um, so when Jesus says, before Abraham was I am, he's revealing that he is God. And the Jewish leaders knew that he was equating himself with God. And that is why they killed him. They put him to death. Because he was making himself out to be God. The son of God. But none of that was clearly revealed until Jesus came. And the church, through the teaching that Christ gave to his apostles, and which was handed down through their preaching and teaching, we call that sacred tradition, that's where we get the formula, the Holy Trinity, and three persons in one God. The, the Greek idea of person was applied to God by the church to help us understand who God is. Now, as I pointed out yesterday, God the Father is God, God the Son is God, God the Holy Spirit is God. Okay? God is eternal, has no beginning. So, did God the Father come before God the Son? No. No. How do we explain this? You can't. Because, well, here's how we explain the Trinity. The Father, God the Father, He is the origin What's the date? of the Trinity. Today is the 30th. He's the origin of the Trinity. And meaning not origin in time, but origin in logic. He's the origin of the Trinity in logic. In logic, not time. Because we're not talking about time with God. God is eternal. So the Father is the origin of the Trinity. Because the Father is the one who eternally begets, okay, begets the Son. The Son goes by another name. What other name does the Son go by? In the beginning was the word. word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? So John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was, was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word is God. Eternally begets, the Father eternally begets the Son, who's called the Word. Why is the Son called the Word? Why do you call the Son of God the Word of God. Well, this, this designation of the Son as the Word, this is what we look at the scriptures. Okay? John 1 1. Okay? John 1 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was the Word was God. Okay? That's the important part. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, the Word is God. How can, what do we mean that, that the Son is the Word and the Father, the Father eternally begets the Son? The Son is not created. Okay? Eternally begets, not created. Okay? Not created. If the Son were created, if the Son were created, the Son would be a creature. That's what the heretic Arius taught. But there was a time when the Son was not. The Son is not created. The Son is eternally begotten. What, do we, what does that mean? To eternally beget the Word. The Father eternally begets the Word. He was always I covered there. this last year. Do you remember? Um, was that he's always there? and like He already, already had him in mind? 
Well, it has something to do with the mind of God. Okay? We conceive ideas in our mind. We use words. We know ourselves imperfectly. If we knew ourselves, if you think you know yourself perfectly, just ask someone you live with some things about you, and they'll tell you things that maybe you don't want to hear, because we don't know ourselves perfectly. God the Father, okay, he knows himself perfectly. Okay. He knows himself perfectly. Okay. Perfectly. And the perfect knowledge of himself, okay, the word is the perfect knowledge of himself. It is so perfect, the Father's knowledge of himself is so perfect that it is another person. Okay. So, um, the Father's knowledge okay, knowledge of himself okay, is so perfect it is a person. It's the word. Okay. Did the Father always know himself perfectly? Yes. That's why we say the Father eternally begets the Son. Like we beget ideas, okay? As we beget ideas, God the Father begets the Word. Okay. So, as we beget ideas, okay? Beget or conceive, okay? Ideas okay, or words, okay? The Father begets the Word, okay? The Word. I'm using an analogy here. Something similar, okay? We beget, conceive ideas, words, okay? Words, okay? The Father begets, begets the Word from, from all eternity. So, from all eternity, God the Father knew himself perfectly from all eternity. And that perfect knowledge of himself is so perfect, it is another person. That's who the Son is, that's who the Word is. That's why John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, this, is, this explains two persons in the Trinity. Where does the third person come in? Well, from all eternity, the Father begets the Son. The, the Word was always with the Father. And there was always, between the Father and the Son, a love. Okay? Between the Father and the Son. The Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father. Their love is so perfect okay. the Holy Spirit is, and this is a theological term, if you look it up in the Catechism, okay, is called the fruit of the love between the Father between Between the Father and the Son. Okay. The Holy Spirit is the person of love in the Trinity. Okay. The person of love in the Trinity. The Father and the Son love each other, and the Holy Spirit didn't come after the Father and the Son. The Father eternally begets the Son. There has been a love that has flowed between the Father and the Son from all eternity, so perfect that it's a person. The love is so perfect, okay? So perfect. It's a person, okay? A person. And that's who the Holy Spirit is. I'll use an analogy, I, another analogy, because we understand by analogy. Last night I'm preparing a couple for marriage, 
And I was explaining this to them. And I said, did you ever talk about your love for one another? And they said, well, yes. When couples are preparing for marriage, especially when married couples, okay, they talk about their love as almost it's another entity between them. Almost like it's another person that's uniting them together. In God, in fact, it is a person. The love between the Father and the Son is so perfect, it is a person. And the Holy Spirit gives himself to the Father and the Son. The Father gives himself totally to the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Son gives himself totally to the Father and the Holy Spirit. And there's a, a communion of persons. I'll write it red here, okay? Communion, or union with, okay? Communion of persons. In love, within the Holy Trinity, okay? A communion of persons. That's really what the Holy Trinity is. This is what we're going to enter into in heaven. We're going to be taken up into this, this love between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. De uh, Nevin asked the question, you know, the, the, the question Plato asked, you know, if God is love, who, whom does he love? Well, after the Trinity is revealed, we know that God loves himself. There's one God, but three persons. Okay? One God, three persons. That's why we say, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we don't say in the names of the name to reflect unity, one. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So three persons, one God. One God, three persons. With no beginning, no end. All three persons are co-equal. All three persons are as it says here on the sheet, equal to but distinct from the other persons. That's important. The Holy Spirit is not less powerful than God the Father. The Father is the origin of the Trinity. The origin, because it is the Father who begets and the Son who is begotten. And the difference between the persons What distinguishes the persons, okay, the difference okay, between three persons is based on their relations, okay? To one another, okay? Their relations. What's the relation between the first person of the Trinity and the second person, like a father to a son? Okay? And the father and the son, uh, their Holy Spirit is related to, to the father and the son as, as the embodiment of their love. So it is the difference between the persons, it is their relations to each other that is the foundation for their difference. Because they're not the, th the same person. That's a heresy that goes back to the beginning of the church. That, that, uh, the son is just another mode of being of the father. No, there are three distinct persons, okay? So, three distinct persons. Three persons distinct, okay? Distinct. Okay. That's why it says equal to but distinct from. The Father is equal to but distinct from the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Son is equal to but distinct from the Father and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is equal to but distinct from the Father and the Son. Now you can go to theology school like I did. I spent a whole semester studying this. This is it in a nutshell. 
all you do is expand on this, and, and this is the best explanation we have of the Holy Trinity. Because it is the central mystery of our faith. We will never be able to understand it fully, even when we're with God in heaven. We have to be infinite, like God, in order to understand who God is. But all three persons, they share their individual persons. That's what it says up here, individual persons. They all have the, they, they, they have the same divine nature, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. And as my, the sheet says here, the Father sent the Son on a mission. The, the mission, the Father sent the Son as Redeemer, and the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit as the Sanctifier. That is, those are the, the missions of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay. The Son to redeem us, that's how he did it on the cross. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. Sanctifier. That's the, the particular work of the Holy Spirit. Even though, properly speaking, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all make us holy, all sanctify us. Okay. But we attribute the work of sanctification especially to the Holy Spirit who was sent on Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit enters our soul in baptism, the Father and the Son enter our soul. When we become temples of the Holy Spirit at baptism, we're temples of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're temples of the Trinity. God dwells in us because we're baptized. That's the greatest gift we have. Sharing God's life called sanctifying grace and God dwelling in us. Both happen at the same time. So, um, this is the mystery of the Trinity, the central mystery of our faith. And we can attempt to grasp it. Okay? We, we, we attempt to understand the Trinity as three individual distinct persons. I'll write individual up here too because that's another thing that would mean, okay? Individual, okay? Individual. And distinct, okay? Three individual distinct persons. The Father is not the Son. The Holy Spirit is not the Father and the Son. They are distinct persons, but they are all God. God the Father is God, God the Son is God, God the Holy Spirit is God. That's one, why I asked my third graders this past Sunday, the God, the Son, come after God the Father. I said, no. Because if he did, he wouldn't be God. He wouldn't be a creature. So, um, <clears throat> now that's the central mystery of our faith, the Holy Trinity. That's the basis of everything. Because this is where it all starts. Okay? A guy didn't have to create. Why did God create? Why do you think why do you think God created? Why do you think he created? Because he wanted us to come Well, he wanted us, in a sense. He wanted to bring us into being, okay. God is love. And out of love he created. Did God need to create us to be happy? No. God was perfectly happy from all eternity as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God did not need us. He didn't need the angels. He didn't need us. He didn't need any, any of creation. He created out of his goodness and out of love. This is love. He likes to share love. So, um, this is the central mystery of our faith. The next great mystery of our faith deals with the prayer that we're going to say in five minutes. Okay? What's the next great mystery of our faith? Can anyone guess? Jesus. The incarnation. Great mystery. Hold the sheet up so it's longer. It's okay. This is God the Son. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I 
Has anyone seen the movie The Passion of Christ? I, I, I love the movie, Mel Gibson's depiction of the devil. How did he depict the devil? He's not a man, not a woman. He's androgynous, like, creepy looking, real creepy looking. At the beginning of the movie, Jesus walks out into the garden, and the devil's there. I mean, you see Jesus stamping his foot on the snake, but off in the, in the shadows is the devil himself. And... Uh, or itself. We're not sure what it is, okay? Um, what does the devil say about to Jesus? He asks a question. Who are you? The devil doesn't know who Jesus is. The devil is trying to foster hatred against Jesus, okay? Uh, if the devil knew that Jesus was God, he wouldn't want Jesus to redeem us because that helps defeat his kingdom. Okay? Uh, remember when Jesus fasts for 40 days before he begins his public ministry, the devil takes him up to the highest mountain and offers him all the kingdoms of the world if he will do what? If he will fall down and worship me. Now, the devil isn't stupid. The devil is very intelligent. If the devil knew that Jesus was God, the Son of God made man, he would never offer a temptation like this to Jesus because Jesus must have been laughing inside, thinking, you know, I'm going to fall down and worship you. This is all mine to begin with. So I created everything. But the devil didn't know who Jesus was. And that's, that's why I think it was so good for Mel Gibson to start that film, The Passion of the Christ, with the devil asking, who are you? In a very angry way. He doesn't know who Jesus is. Okay? And most of the world doesn't know who Jesus is. That's the problem. If the world really understood who Jesus Christ was, well, then people would be flocking uh, to become Christians. If the world doesn't understand who Jesus is, or they don't believe who he says he is. Okay. Now, God the Son, okay. with Jesus we have someone who's both God and man, right? He's God from all eternity. He's the second person of the Trinity, eternally begotten by the Father. From all eternity, the Son existed. The second person of the Trinity existed from all eternity. No beginning, no end. Same nature as God the Father. Okay. Divine mind, divine will that he shares with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Okay. And as the top of the sheet says there, because he has one and the same nature with God the Father, being the second person of the Blessed Trinity, okay? And <clears throat> we have to define our terms. What is a nature and what is a person? Top left side, what is a nature? Oh, do you know what a thing is? I was just going to say, are a you nature? asking about divine nature, like Jesus' is divine nature? But what is nature? What is nature? When we say the nature of a thing, we're talking about what a thing is. So, Jesus has a nature, the Son of God has a nature, a divine nature. What does that mean for the Son to have a divine nature? He's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, he's infinite, he's eternal. Okay. That's what to have a divine nature means. Okay. Um, on the right-hand side up here, divine nature, Jesus has a divine mind, all-knowing, and a divine will that's all-loving. He has that as the second person of the Trinity. But that's not the totality of Jesus, because in time, Jesus, the Son of God, the Word, became man. And Jesus is God and man. Why? Because he has a human nature, as well as a divine nature. I'll, we'll, we'll pray in just a minute. Okay. And that human nature, what is, it, what is a human nature? What are we talking about when we're talking about a human nature? A what? Like not ourselves. What does a human nature consist of? Besides, besides just our, our spiritual part, you, you're, you're on the right track. Okay, we have a, 
a free will, we have an intellect, that's the soul. Uh, okay. But a human nature is not just a spiritual thing, it's also a material thing. So what makes up our human nature? What constitutes a human nature? Besides an intellect and free will, which is the spiritual side of us. Body. We have a body, that's it, okay? A body and soul. We have a human body that's, that's finite. Jesus had a human body, which was finite. And he had a human soul, which was finite. What does a human soul consist of? Too many faculties of the powers of the human soul. Intellect and will. Had emotions, we have emotions too. We have uh, memory, we have uh, imagination. Jesus had all those things. He was fully human. So Jesus had, okay, Jesus in his human nature, okay, um, which was conceived on Annunciation Day by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who gave birth to him on the first Christmas day, but up here, that he has a human body, he took a human body to suffer and die on the cross with, and a human soul with a human intellect and a human will, with his human will, he offered his body and blood upon the cross and sacrifice. Because with his divine will, he can't offer his divine will to himself. He's God. With his human will, he offers his body and soul up to God the Father. Jesus is both God and man. He's got a human mind and a human will, but a divine mind and a divine will. And, and here's the key thing. Is Jesus a human person, a divine person, or both a human and divine person? You can't, you can only be one person. You can't you can only be one person. Natures, so is he, a, is he a divine or a human person? Human, human person. with a divine nature. Just the opposite. Oh. He's, a divine, he's, he's a divine, divine person. person. He's only one person. He's a divine person. He's remember this. He's the second person of the Trinity. That's how you remember he's a divine person. Jesus is the Word. He's the second person of the Trinity. With two natures. He's got a divine nature because he's God, always been God, eternally begotten. He's got a human nature that he took when he, at the conception, at the incarnation, with a human body and a human soul. But he's only one person. He's not two persons. He's not a human person. That's what I say on the right side here. One divine person is Jesus, not a human person, but he has two natures. A nature is what someone is. What is, what is Jesus? He's God and man. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you. But a person is who someone is. And we give a name to a person. So, one divine person, two natures. Not a human person. you got to get this straight to understand who Jesus is. Okay? Because if you get this wrong, you're, you'll be a heretic. I'll explain, um, before we pray the Angelus, about one of the great heresies in the church. There was a bishop in the early 400s, the 420s, named Nestorius. And Nestorius went around teaching that Mary was the mother of Jesus, but not the mother of God. Do we call Mary the mother of God? Yes. How could she be the mother of God? Well, because she conceived the word who became flesh in her womb. There's only one person that she conceived. The divine person who took a human nature, united a human nature to himself while remaining God. Jesus was always God, always the eternal word, but in the womb of Virgin Mary, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he took a human nature, meaning the Holy Spirit created a human body and a human soul and that was united to Jesus' person, his divine person. That's why we can say that Mary is the mother of God. Because she conceived the divine person in her womb who became a man. Not that Mary, not that the Son, the 
began his existence in Mary's womb. The Son always existed. But the Word, who was eternal, became flesh, took a human nature in Mary's womb. And Jesus is only one person. Nestorius taught that Jesus was two persons, a divine person, he understood he was the Son of God, okay, but a human person as well. And that Mary conceived the human person in her womb by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then, at the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan, the divine person united himself to the human person, and that's the full Jesus, divine person and human person. Ah, uh ah, -uh, heresy. Heresy. Jesus is only one person. Mary conceived the person of Christ in her womb, who was always God, but became man in her womb. That's why we can call her truly the mother of God. Understanding that the Son of God didn't begin his existence in Mary's womb. He always existed. But this is the mystery of the, of the incarnation. If you, if you get this wrong, you could, you could fall into heresy. So, um, knowing that, now we're going to pray the Angelus Prayer. Okay? Let us stand. And V is the leader, okay? Our response. And then I'll pray the first half of the Hail Mary. You pray the second half of the Hail Mary. And the tradition in the church is that at the third um, little dialogue between the leader and the responders at the words, the word was made flesh, that you genuflect to one knee as an act of humility knowing that God became man. Okay. So, let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. And the Word was made flesh. Go down to one knee, right knee, okay, and then stand. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. Yeah, Together let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ, thy Son, was made known by the message of an angel, made by his passion and cross, be brought to the glory of his resurrection. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.